everyone, and welcome to another episode of Shoes Off Inside. How are you? <laughs> How are you, Kelly Tamlin? How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. I'm Shoes off inside with MKT. Where are you, Kelly? Who? I am in New York. These <sighs> these these pieces of art in back of me are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> You're in some random I, room. I'm working. Yeah, I'm working on a on a show out here. I, I can't talk about it yet. Can't talk about uh, it yet. Uh, but oh, I am but working. we can't wait. We can't wait. Yay! I know. I know. Is it freezing? I'm always happy to be working. Is it freezing in New York? I was just there. So. It is so cold. It yeah. snowed. It snowed earlier. Oh, really? Yeah. It did. Oh, wow. yeah. that's and, you know this Hawaiian does not know how to dress for winter. <laughs> <laughs> Too many layers. Get all sweaty. And I'll then tell you what the secret is. Don't know how to take is. it all off. Yeah. I'll tell you what the secret is. Silk long underwear and silk long underwear top. Yeah. Or yeah. or heat tech. Underwear from Uniqlo. Oh, because um, I have both, okay. and I prefer Heat Tech. Heat Tech is the uh, is the brand, so it's all they have tights, they have underwear, they have bras, they have camisoles, oh. they have long sleeve, they have short sleeve, they have tank tops, and it's super inexpensive. And you could order it online, and they come oh. in all kinds of colors. And is it so, thin? Is it thin? I, it's very thin. Okay, that's the that's the key because you don't want to wear anything bulky underneath. It's, it's right. super, super thin. Go, go, go to Uniqlo and get a couple of pieces of heat tech. And um, silk is great, but it can be expensive. But the, the cute colors. Ah, At Uniqlo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here's, there's a hot tip for you guys. There's a hot tip Yay. for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Thanks, okay. Guys. So it, right now I'm going to date this because it's December 12th today yes. on Monday. And this morning the Golden Globe nominations were announced. And Woo-hoo. it was a huge celebration for the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. It got six nominations. Incredible, Woo-hoo. including Best Picture, Comedy Musical, Best Actress, Michelle Yeoh, Best Supporting Actor, Kehue Kwan, uh, Best Supporting Actress, uh, Jamie, Lee, Jamie Curtis, Lee Curtis, Best Screenplay, Best Director. I mean, sweet. All the biggies. All, all the, biggies. the biggies. They got all the big but ones. But shout out to Stephanie Sue as well. Because she, yes, I'm so yes. disappointed yes. she did not get a nod. Yeah, she should have. Fantastic. Her imagination as to plugging into this multiverse yeah. was phenomenal. And no wonder, you know, she's she's just really, really something ha- special. Yeah. So, so I have a ascend. feeling she will probably get a nomination for an Oscar. Um, I do, I do. I I just feel like her performance uh, was so phenomenal that I think the Oscars will appreciate that. Not that the Golden Globes didn't, but maybe they just, you know, saw some other... And and, and I'm going to paint the wide, you know, broad swath. I think the Golden Globes are old school. I think it's a very, very, you know, very specialized, small group of people. There's only 80-something members. They're like, right? And, they're, yeah. and they're, I think they're all older than us. So I think they have a skewed, um, you know, a view as to what, you know, or who should be nom- who should be nominated. Who should be nominated. So right. I, I think, I mean, yeah. and, and, yeah. and, and look at all the scandal that happened, you know, last year, last right? Year. right. They, everybody was wondering if they were even going to be back this right. year. Right. right. You know, right. whether or not they were even going to have an event at all, much less televised. Yeah. There was right. some so it'll be really interesting on. to see who shows up, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's see if they can, you know, kind of patch up their, you know, um, their wounds and all that. Uh, but Oscars, we'll, we'll see about the Oscars. Oscars coming down the road, but I have a feeling yes. that might be a little bit different and more nominations for the movie for sure. And Michelle yes. Yeoh, let's not forget, Bow she was down. also named the Time, Times icon. icon of the Year. Right? Ooh, I mean, that's right? amazing, right? Here's Huge. the thing. Okay, you it's, guys it's, know be- it's, you guys know better than me because you're both you know in the acting world, but. Michelle Yeoh has been around for a long time. It's not like she came out of nowhere. People all right. of a sudden are like, like they just discovered her. And it's like, no, people, she's been doing she's this been for around. a long yeah. time. She's been, she's been coming, you know, coming across and doing stuff over there and yes. coming back here. And, you know, it just makes, I, I, I think as women, as Asian women, as Asian women of a certain age, I, yeah. it's just, I'm just so she's very 60. proud. She's 60. She's 60. Yeah, she's just I'm like, so very proud. She's like, keeps peaking, you know? Yeah. She just get, keeps yeah. on getting better. 
which yeah. is, yeah. you know, I mean, that's that story in itself is just so beautiful. So yeah. congratulations and, to her. And it couldn't happen to a nicer person. I've she only met her so, once and she is the sweetest. She really is. Oh. <laughs> yes. Know. Tam, you and I were at the East West Players Gala earlier this year um, when Michelle Yeoh yes. was a, an invited guest. She won an award. Uh, yeah, I yes. think she won an award that night. And I, I remember I gave a, a little speech about anti-Asian hate and why it's so important to pay attention. And afterwards, I just wanted to say hello to her and everybody was crowding around her. So I kind right, of like right, right, weaseled right, right. my way in and I was just like, Michelle, thank you so much for coming. And she turns around, she's like, oh my God, you were so powerful. Thank you so much for saying what you did. And she <laughs> oh just gave me the, she, and she was so genuinely gracious um, and grateful. And I was like, oh my God, really? But really, like she's the real deal. Mm -hmm. She's the real yeah, deal. Yeah, she is. Yeah. yeah, we want her on the show Absolutely. though. Michelle, we yeah, want you yeah. to come on the show, please. <laughs> oh. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can't imagine. Jam it into her schedule. I'm going to yeah, try yeah. to get her on let's, the show. Let's make that happen. Yes. Let's manifest that. Because that would be fabulous to have a, a really authentic conversation with her. But congratulations to the whole team at that movie. It's going to, I have a feeling it's going to sweep the entire award season, actually. Oh, um, I hope so. But I now, so. going back to New York, Kelly, you're there. I was just there. And yes. I very thankfully was able to watch the musical on Broadway, K-pop. Now, most of us know now what's, what happened to the show after only a two week run on Broadway, it was canceled and they had their last show just this Sunday, just yesterday, awesome. yesterday. on the 11th, December 11th. Right. And it was devastating, right? Because this was a groundbreaking show, all Asian cast, except for one non-Asian character. And it was written by an Asian um, female composer, all the music. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was celebrating everything about K-pop, but also just, you know, being Asian, the culture, and, and sort of like the melding of East-West. It was a brilliantly done show, I have to say. And When you went, May, yeah. was the audience mostly Asian? No, it was mixed. It was okay, pretty diverse. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was looking around. I made a point to look around saying, okay, is That's this just all a bunch of K-pop fans? No, it was very diverse. And that okay. made me so happy. So when I went only two days before the announcement came out that they were closing, I was like, oh, oh, great. This is going to do well because look, it's full. I went on oh. a Sunday at 3 p.m., 3 p.m. show, and it was full. And I was like, good, this is, this is a good sign. And then all of a sudden we hear this announcement. Now the controversy of course, is that here's this Broadway show, all Asian cast and you know, just no support and da, 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 whatever. And so was it too soon again, right? Broadway just doesn't want anything that isn't that traditional, typical Broadway show from a mm -hmm. Western lens, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Did you mm -hmm. go before or after that? terrible critique the new york times critique no i went after and so okay. that was something so that we, it was still full even after that critique still full and i was hoping that the actual the horrible review would actually help boost ticket sales because people were so pissed about this right, review right, by right, jesse right. green of the new york right. times who really was had nothing good to say about the show including saying some you know racially charged comments about squinty eyed, you know, squint inducing lighting. Um, and then also saying, if you don't speak Korean or not a K-pop fan or don't understand Korean culture, this is not the show for you. That's right. how he started his review. Right. Um, and so, you know, all of us were saying, oh, okay, but if it was like an Italian, you know, or French, uh, like an opera is, that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's because it's an Asian language and Asian culture. Somehow it's not accepted. So there was, mm -hmm. there's a lot to this story, but it's, it's maddening, you know, for, for the Asian culture and for Asian artists, especially to try to make these breakthroughs. And yet once again, we're like being like pushed down, you know, mm -hmm. by, right. by tradition, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Right. Yeah, it's not being critiqued or judged by by the content or the story that it presents. It's always this this foreign aspect that's attached to yes. it that it's not or it's not good enough or it's not spectacular enough to because it feels like, you know, the shows that come out of Asian America have to be 
twice as good at whatever is traditionally put up on Broadway because right. yeah, it's, it's always that same kind of cyclical thing. I'm sorry. I interrupted you, Kelly. I was going to say, did you guys get to see, um, uh, allegiance when I it was on it Broadway here in LA? I saw it when in, it came LA. in LA. Okay. Yeah, I saw it both in New York and in LA. So, Same. and then now it's and just to quickly add, it's going to it's playing in London, in London. starting in January. Oh, so it, yeah, it'll be playing in in starting in January, and it'll probably run uh, through March mm-hmm. over in London. So, you know, with George, and I, mean, I don't know who is in the cast or or who's directing it, but but George yeah, Takei is going to be in it again, correct, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. So for yeah. those of you who don't know, Allegiance is a, a Broadway play that is about Japanese incarceration. Um, Actually, can I correct you there? Because oh. this is something that's personal to me. But when, when it's Japanese car- incarceration, because that's always been tough. It's American incarceration. Uh, it's an yeah. American oh, incarceration. I'm glad you're cast. saying that. It's a, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Thank you. And it's an American internment cast because most of the 122,000 persons who were incarcerated during World War II being of Japanese descent were American citizens. Two thirds were American citizens. So it's time it's time for all of us to try to change that language because it's again, it's it's acknowledging what our history is. Yeah. And as long as we can acknowledge acknowledge it, we can be held accountable for it, we can apologize for it and we can move on. Right. So yeah. so that's so allegiance is that story inspired by the events that took place in George Takei's life when his family were incarcerated in Tule Lake. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story about those events uh, leading up to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor happens and the incarceration yeah. of 120,000 people. It's such, a yeah. beautiful, it's such a beautiful play, heartbreaking right. um, and, and mo- emotional, joyful, celebra- celebratory. I mean, it, it's everything. It's right, everything. Right. I took right. a girlfriend of mine to that play, and she's Jewish American, right? So yes. nothing to do with Asian culture. I've never heard someone sob so much. Oh. I mean, she oh. was going <laughs> like this, <laughs> and she was so impacted by the play that she took her entire, brought her entire family back. Her oh, parents, her awesome. nephews, her. I mean, it was so. It's that kind of storytelling that can go beyond you know, yeah. recognition yeah. of just because we are Asian, we're supposed to go, no, it should, it should be introduced to everyone. That's why K-pop, you know, going back to that, it's like, yes. they didn't give it a chance. Two yes. weeks? How the yeah. hell is anybody supposed to know about it, let alone get tickets and go and see it? I and say they should bring it to LA. Absolutely. Like they did Allegiance, you know, and then you will build that absolutely. audience and maybe they can go on tour, but I really think it's worthy. Having seen it, it is so worthy. The music itself is so right? good. It's yeah, so good. Right? And, you know, my non-Asian partner, he came with me and he was totally blown away. He oh. loved it. Loved it. Yeah. So it is <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Like, K-pop is so popular amongst young kids. Yeah. I mean, it's you, it, not even Asian kids, no, just it's global kids. It's global. And all yeah. kids are learning Korean so they can <laughs> sing along to the lyrics totally. as well as the dance moves yeah. that they're popping. It's like, it's, an, it's a worldwide no, phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. But, yeah. Yeah. It's a phenomenon. Yeah. So I have hope that K- it, this is not the last we're going to hear of K-pop. Absolutely yeah. not. It will come back yeah. in another form somewhere else and it will be appreciated. So, yeah. so there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're getting it. We're in the holidays, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see my little, my little. Oh, look at it. It's this little <laughs> Christmas wreath on, right? But um, so we, though, wanted to talk about something a little bit more serious um, for a part of this episode, which is mental health, right? Um, yes. Especially post COVID, we're still in it, but you know what I mean. Um, going into the holidays, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people are dealing with constantly. And then within the Asian American community, as all of us know, it's something that's still considered a bit taboo to talk openly about mental health. So we thought we'd invite someone who is phenomenally an expert in this field, Dr. Jenny Wong. Um, She is a psychologist and she started um, the Asian Mental Health Collective um, a directory to help people find Asian therapists. So she is totally in the know. So we wanted to speak with her about this uh, very, very important topic. So here is that interview. 
Dr. Jenny Wong, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we had to have you because you have been such uh, someone on the forefront of mental health, but especially with Asian mental health, clearly, because mm. you started the Asian Mental Health Collective. And so let's first start off with why you decided to start this mental health collective and, um, you know, what, what purpose you wanted to serve. I think early on, there was just an awareness that mental health in kind of Western philosophy, Western spheres, didn't really prioritize Asian American identity and how we understood mental health. Mm -hmm. And so early on, honestly, when I started my Instagram account, Asians for Mental Health, I was just trying to build a directory. I thought, you know, if there was some place where people could go to find a therapist in their state who is licensed and who identified as Asian American, maybe that was just one less barrier to entry into therapy. And so I remember in those early days, DMing therapists that were Asian American and saying, hey, would you fill out this Google form and please join our directory? Mm -hmm. And as the account grew and as we started to realize that there was so much need, we really started to think there potentially was more opportunities for more things that we could offer. Um, I'm no longer with the Asian American or the Asian Mental Health Collective now. I kind of have my own platform, Asians for Mental Health. Um, but mm. to see now there are several platforms that have evolved, like Asian Mental Health Project as well, that allow multiple ways in which Asian Americans can interface with the topic of mental health. And that's what's really exciting, I think. Yeah, it is, because I'll tell you something. When I opened up that directory, I couldn't believe how right. many were listed, right? And mm -hmm. because even back when I was trying to find a therapist, when I went through uh, some horrible grief, it was very difficult to find an yes. Asian therapist of any kind. So this has changed the game completely for people who are seeking help, right? Now, the, the issue is, are people seeking help now? Because there's still that taboo, isn't there? Yes, 100%. I think the research tells us that even with financial assistance, even with knowledge and some awareness, stigma surrounding mental health, and in particular in Asian American culture, still presents it's a massive barrier for people to consider it. Is that spe and, spe uh, specifically pertaining to families with first generation parents or how I define uh, parents who immigrated from our mother countries to the U.S.? Or is it across the board generation generationally? And I'm sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. I think that's a great question. And I don't know that we have done that disaggregated data analysis yeah. yet. Yeah. So when I think about perhaps you know, like my parents, I was born in Taiwan, but came here when I was two. So I would say I'm kind of like 1.5 generation, but you have Asian Americans who've been here for three, four, five generations, right? And when you think about that acculturation process, I find that some Asian Americans who are further along in acculturation might be more open to ideas about discussing mental health with non-family, non-friends, right? Because often, oh, you feel sad? Well, you should talk to your friends about it. Or why would you talk to a stranger, right, about your problems? Right. right. And I think sometimes because of the kind of you know, generations in which people have come here and immigrated, they might have a little bit more knowledge and kind of, you know, dispelled some of the myths surrounding mental health treatment and so might be more open. But I will say this this younger generation of folks in their 20s to 35, they're doing something. And I don't know if it's the confluence of technology and social media that's making yeah. mental health one of those banner topics. Yeah. But they're saying, I'm not going to be silent anymore. I'm speaking out. I'm telling my story. And mm. they're doing it so courageously. And I think truly, truly, that is how we destigmatize mental health is when I see an Asian American say, I went through this and I struggled with this and I took medication and I sought therapy and it was effective for me. It gives each other permission to perhaps do the same. Right. Mm, lovely. Can you explain why it's so it, it matters for people to have therapists of, you know, that that come from their own culture? When you think about mental health, 
I feel as though it is grounded in our story, right? It's grounded in the story of who I see myself to be in the context of the world, but it's also grounded in the story of my people, my ancestors, my lineage, my culture. So how I interface with the world is impacted by all of these narratives, one of which is the cultural narrative, right, is the racial identity narrative. And so a lot of Asian Americans will say, you know, you're the first Asian American therapist I've ever had. And it's so relieving to not necessarily have to explain to you those cultural elements like saving face, like filial piety. Dr. Wayne, like that's scare. exactly, I was just, I'm going to interrupt because that's exactly <laughs> the point, right? Not having to explain and simplify yes. the complexity yep. of our background and our culture and tradition, the filial piety. I remember trying to explain to a non-Asian therapist that I tried to go to, and she mm -hmm. just thought I was like crazy. Like I, she was like looking at me like, yes. "What do you mean you can't talk back to your mother and tell her to <laughs> you know f off?" I was just like, "Oh my god!" Right. So right. that is right. such an vital right. point to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the explaining of those elements represents yet another burden that we carry trying to seek care. Right. So we have the burden of what's bothering us or what's stressful. And now on top of that, I have to do the work or the labor of educating another person about yeah. these dynamics. And also when there is potentially not a cultural humility on the part of the therapist, we can do damage. We can do harm to clients. Mm, mm. And I think sometimes when we don't have that humility, we might say, ooh, you struggle with boundaries with your family. There's something wrong with you, right? Mm. Instead of saying, actually, boundaries might look differently in Asian American families, right? Mm, right? Mm. They don't fit this Western kind of model or conceptualization. And yet there's strength here as well. Right. And I think one of the things we have to be really careful about is not seeing our culture from a place of deficit. Because that more so is how kind of white dominant society frames Asian culture, right? You're too enmeshed. You can't say no to your parents. You let them control your whole life. Those types of narratives. And it's like, no, no, no. Actually, we have a value system that mm. is very much about interconnection. Yeah. It's about relational harmony. And those things value just as much as things like autonomy, independence, right? Those things I hold in weight against each other. And I don't have to abandon one for the other. Right. Mm. Right. I don't have to right. choose. Right. And I, 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 for, for me to, to hear you, know, you speak about it, because in order to get comfortable with the idea of, uh, of, of taking care of one's mental health, there is also the communicative need to understand what the words boundary need, boundaries are, uh, relational, uh, relation, relational value. I mean, these are the, 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 I guess, therapy talk words that I'd like to use just casually here in this conversation. But to try to explain that to my mother or to the elders, it's, it's, it's not only do we find affinity in identifying with the therapist who happens to come from a similar background as us, but also to help us along with the, the shame of not knowing what, what do you mean by bound, what does passive aggressive mean? What does you know, the timeouts mean, you know, the just basic building blocks as to how we can take care of one another so we can take care of the communication skills we want to develop with each other. So I, I it is, it's, there's, there's the value to having somebody from a similar background, but also it carries on to relationships with others who don't have our relation or who don't have our cultural background, because it's, it's just a, a, a very foundational building block from where we can grow and uh, plant seeds so, so which we, we can grow with. Yeah, but with a shared experience to a certain extent um, that isn't mm -hmm. talked about, though, enough and open right. in an open way as we're doing now. This is why we want to talk about this. And so mm -hmm. some people think they're so isolated in, in their experience, right, especially as an Asian 
because we are treated as outsiders and foreign. So let me ask you this, Dr. Wong. I, you wrote this book called Permission mm -hmm. to Come Home. Yes. Which is exactly what we're talking about. You wrote it because you wanted to be able to identify with why mental health has to do with culture and tradition and these things that make us who we are. And I love what you said. It shouldn't just be seen as a negative. It's also a positive mm -hmm. too. But how do we decipher that? And how do we, as you say in the book, question everything? Thanks. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. And I think that's why that first chapter was to encourage us, invite us into a space where we say, what assumptions do I have? And are they really working for me? Right. Because there Ooh. might be elements of Asian culture or, or Asian cultural values that work for someone, but less so for another. And that has no morality to it. It's not good or bad. Right. It's just how that person's life experience and their personality and how they're wired interfaces with those values, right? So I always use the example of, you know, like we, we have all heard of the adage, like there are only a few professions in this life, doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? According to Asian parents. Yeah. And <laughs> if you wanted to be a doctor, then there's a, a nice alignment with perhaps that kind of old stereotype. But if you wanted to be anything else, like for me, wanting to be a psychologist was so out of my parents' framework that they were like, wait, what? Are you going to starve? Are you going to make any money as a psychologist? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was a misalignment in those expectations. Right. And what I wanted to do for myself. And when we're in those inflection points, we kind of have to say, okay, if I follow what these values and expectations kind of are suggesting I do, at what cost to myself? Mm. At what kind of sustainability is that choice? Could I sustain being something that I do not actually want to be for a whole career, mm. right? And what is the longevity of that? You know what I mean? And so I think that when we're in those points where there's friction between what people will say, like the American side of me and then the Asian side of me, I kind of say, could we see it as we have access to both? And we can call and pull from each of these identities, yeah. the things that align with who I'm trying to become and the life I'm trying to build. Right. And that's what I think younger people are starting to understand a little bit more mm -hmm. than maybe our generation that was under more of that pressure to stay within that sort of narrow box. Um, now, I, I, yeah. I heard tw about 20 years ago that um, Asian American kids, college age kids had the highest rate of suicide. Does that still hold true at this day and age? So if we look at the age group of 15 to 29, it does appear that suicidality is one of the highest reasons as to why those young adults are dying compared to other ethnic groups. However, you know, this is also because black and brown, you know, young adults of that age group also may be dying from other reasons, right, due to the complexities of having living in a black and brown body. And so it is, this data is complex, and I think requires a lot more nuance to understand. But I do think when I go, when I talk to college campuses, and I talk to the counseling centers, they do say that their Asian American students in particular are struggling in a way where they're they're struggling to meet the demands and needs of their mental health yeah. difficulties. So there's something there. And I think, and it's hard to say if that's due to underutilization of mental health services. So they are struggling in a more crisis level range, or is it that they are truly facing, you know, difficulties that are more than the average young adult, it's hard to say, well, let, but there is you, something. Yeah. Can I ask you something, Jenny, then um, that has to do with the last couple of years of what we've all been mm. going through, right? With COVID and then the anti-Asian hate. And I know some of my students at USC tell me, Asian students, you know, tell mm -hmm. me that it has been doubly difficult for them 
you know, given yes. the fact that they are under pressure anyway, right, with right. whether family pressure, academic pressure, societal pressure, then on top of that, the identity crisis and the anti-Asian yes. hate. So t- from your experience, you know, is that obviously, you know, exacerbating the, the issue and what can we do to try to, you know, get people and young people back on track and help them? I mean, I want this mm-hmm. interview to also have some takeaway you know, good takeaway right. information mm-hmm. that, that people can use. Mm-hmm. Yes. So when we look at kind of Asian Americans in their reports of their mental health difficulties, there absolutely was a spike or an increase in anxiety, right? Fear, worries about themselves or their loved ones. You know, you had college students where they were worried that their parents, you know, across several states couldn't go to the grocery store because they were concerned that they might be attacked, right? 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 So not only are they you know, college student in the midst of pandemic, they're also worried about the safety and health of their family members. And so I think also in the midst of pandemic and the rise of anti-Asian hate, Asian Americans had to confront a very confusing kind of identity paradigm in the sense that we're really confronting the, the myth of the model minority Mm-hmm. as well as the reality of the perpetual foreigner stereotypes for individuals who, who you know had features of Asian American identity. And so for a long time you had Asian Americans who said, "Oh, but it's we're we're it's good to be a model minority, is it not?" right? Like we're touted to be these successful individuals. And yet on the flip of a dime, you could see that suddenly society said, no, we don't want people like you here. Right. You're scary. You're a threat, right? You bring disease. Mm. And so I think there was a dissonance that was starting to happen between these narratives of who we were in society and how racism actually impacted us as Asian Americans. And so I I do think to answer your question, there was absolutely an effect, you know, on young adults as they were trying to navigate COVID or just even all adults and children, right? It was such a difficult time. Now, the question that follows is now, what do we do? And I think over pandemic, what was so lovely for all the reasons I don't like social media, it was wonderful to see people take that pain and the stru- the stories of kind of their racial identity and they were creative and they were mm. collaborative and they created nonprofits and they really realized that their pain could be utilized in a way that could uplift our community mm. in really powerful ways. And I think that in itself, advocacy, activism, community, that has been the bomb for a lot of this. It's still painful, but it is something that helps us feel as though we're connected and there's strength in that. Mm. I also am a big believer that as human beings, but especially as Asian Americans, understanding our emotional lives And tolerating emotional discomfort is key to mental health. If I don't know how to hold negative emotion, I'm either going to suppress it or avoid it, or it's going to come out sideways, like I like to say to my clients, right? If I can't name it, understand it, harness it, and really act upon my emotions in a healthy way, it starts to get kind of buried below the surface, and then it comes out passive aggressively or aggressively, or in these ways that are uncontrolled. And in Asian culture, I was never taught, how do you understand your emotions, right? I was just taught, oh, don't feel it. Just stop crying. You'll Mm -hmm, be fine, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, Go take mm -hmm. a nap. Just just bury it. (laughs) (laughs) Right, 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 right. Right? So in effect, we missed out on just simply emotional literacy skill development. And I wish I could teach this like in schools, which some there are many academics who are doing that now. I could teach young adults these skills because if I can hold and sit with my negative emotions long enough, now I can understand it. I can now communicate it Mm. and I can gather power around it 
to enact change in my life. Do you have some tips that, on how to teach it? I mean, seriously, you just said, <laughs> I wish I could teach it. Well, how would you teach that? So I do talk about that in my book. That's actually chapter two. Oh, okay. Like Everyone buy the book. Feel. Everyone, Everyone buy, buy the book, yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is one of the things we forget, right, is that this is something that's taught when we're children, right? When I have children now. And so when they feel intensely, I become like a vessel for their emotional lives, right? When they're crying, when they're disappointed, when they're hurt. If I can sit and be with them in that emotion, they can feel the rise of that wave of emotion and the fall and realize that it doesn't destroy them. It doesn't make others uncomfortable to be in it with them, right? I'm not scared of it as the adult and you don't have to be scared of it either as the child. That is one of the biggest gifts we can give our kids. And so when we actually don't get that in our own development, right, I I rarely feel like my parents had the skills, the energy to do that for me. You have to learn it later in life, right? And so being able to sit with the discomfort of intense emotions becomes a muscle that you can grow and strengthen. It's a skill. It is absolutely a skill. skill. It's a tool that you know, not only children need to learn, but we need to learn. And it's, I think it's the elders again, because yes, assuming, you know, because we weren't taught it by our parents, I presume that our parents were taught. No, again, it's, it's like being like sandwiched in between our children's uh, mental health. And then our elders, we have to take responsibility in how we can help both generations, you know, adjacent to us, figure out that language and hold, yeah, hold that emotion because it is a power. It's a, it's a tool set. It's a, it's a skill. So thank you. Yeah. So I remember, you know, talking about um, locking away our parents telling us literally to lock things away. I remember something traumatic that happened to me as a child and my mother literally saying, why you got to bring that kind of stuff up for? Just put it in a place inside your heart and lock it up with a key and throw it away. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, no. Yeah, we did. But that's the thing. We did. And so I love hearing when I don't love it. It's painful to hear it, but it's true that Mm -hmm. all of this that we did suppress eventually has to come out somewhere um, or else we get ill like physically yeah. ill, right? And I know yeah. that I definitely have repressed so much that I felt things triggering here and there, mm-hmm. especially the last three years um, of all that racism and all the bullying and all that stuff. So it's so interesting to see e- even as full grown adults that we still have so much shit, you know, that we're trying to deal with that we're not allowing and we're not recognizing or we're not admitting to. So mm-hmm. can I ask mm-hmm. you that Jenny, about the fact that even as adults, and I think Asian Mm -hmm. women, since this is a show that's sort of focused on Asian women, um, we tend to do a lot more of that than the average person. Right. For various reasons. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do? What do do we need to do as Asian women to kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, find peace and get to a better place? I think... One of the things sometimes we have to recognize is that as Asian women, as women who come from intergenerational transmission of cultural values, that they were steeped in systems like patriarchy, misogyny, Mm -hmm. right? And so we are still affected by that, right? I think back to even my grandmother's generation, and she was a farmer's daughter, and she didn't get to go to school. School, right. Somebody had to work the farm and the girls did because the boys got to go to school. Right. So if you think about that, that lineage is part of how we're socialized. We're told or policed to be certain ways to not have a voice, just be a face. Right. And so all of 
that contributes to the way that we may or may not show up, right, in our current lives. And the swallowing of our bitterness Mm -hmm. sometimes is seen as like a point of pride, right? Like I swallowed so much bitterness. I should feel (laughs) right. Totally. Right? Yes. Yeah. I I held on to it for 30 years. I held on to it for 31 years. It's like, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I think that those effects, right, I think back to colonization in many Asian countries, I think about imperialism, I think about the effects of being oppressed people from many different Asian countries, that that also instills a sense of fear, that if I speak up, if I fight back, if I say what I truly need and want, then there might be somebody higher up in that hierarchy who stamps me back down right. or corrects me, right? And says, uh-uh, that's, you need to get back in line. Mm. So there's a lot of systemic trauma that I think our parents, our grandparents, great-great-parents also witnessed that created a sense of trauma response mm. that even our generation as grown women we are still trying to heal out of. Hmm. And so what can we do? I always say, do you know who you are? Truly as women, as a person, as a, each of your identities, mother, daughter, sister, friend, right? Partner. Do you know who you are in those relationships or are you subsumed in those relationships, Mm. right? Mm. So as a mother, am I, do I know who I am as a mother and can I stand in that? Or am I actually simply just subsumed under the needs, the demands, the priorities of my kids' lives? Or am I along with them in this journey where I have an identity in addition to being their mother? Mm. Because as Asian American women, I think we're often taught to be subsumed, like get married, have a husband, Mm -hmm. then you can be subsumed into that, right? He'll protect you. And -hmm. and I'm like, well, let's question that a little bit. Maybe that's what that looked like for your parents' generation or before that. But do we want to be in that type of dynamic or do I want to be alongside my partner? And if that is the priority for me, then how do I start to behave in ways that mirror that type of relationship that I want? And that goes for how you engage with your parents, your siblings, your friendships, your colleagues. How much are we shrinking ourselves to make way for other people? Mm. And how much are we willing to take up space and believe that in my taking up space, I'm actually empowering and uplifting others as well? Oh, amen, sister. <laughs> yeah. I love that. God, I love that yeah. so much. Yeah. Because yeah. Th- th- not only is this an Asian w- woman thing, it's a female thing, isn't it's it? It's a female thing. It's really a female yes. thing. We all tend to do that and make way. Sacrifice. Yeah. Right. We sacrifice sacrifice. ourselves for the sake of our family, you know, whether it be our children, our spouse, our parents. Right. Um, You know, we are constantly thinking of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Giving of ourselves toward the group, toward the partner, toward the. Which is a wonderful thing. Everyone else is happy. Yeah. Which is a wonderful thing. But, you know, at what expense? Well, it's the woman's expense. Yeah. 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 Ah, that, that was super powerful. Okay. Uh, We're running out of time a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you this question because we're in the holidays, of course, Mm -hmm. and this is Ah, a joyful time for a lot of us, but also it's a terrible time for a lot of people, right? It's the loneliest time. It's when depression Mm -hmm. rises. Um, and so can you give us some tips for people who might be feeling this way? What, what can they do and what can we do to help people who may feel this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, May, like you mentioned, the holidays are super complex, right? <laughs> because when everybody's out there smiling, celebrating, wishing each other festivities and well, a lot of people might feel the exact opposite, 
Right. Yeah. Because it is sometimes a reminder of who's no longer mm-hmm. there, right? Who's missing from the dinner table. It might also be a reminder of relationships that we wish were better, but they're not, right? Some people are estranged from their families because there's toxicity and harm there, right? There also is a priority towards connection, but what if you don't have many connections and everybody goes out of town and leaves and sees all their family and you are alone, right? So there's lots of grief that sits alongside the joy, joyous time of holidays. And I think something that is really important is we think about our capacity during the holiday season, Mm -hmm. right? Because if we are grieving, if we are mourning the mother I wish I had, but I don't have a relationship that I, I want with my mother, and so I don't... I'm not going to see her this holiday season, right? If that's a place where you are, then that grief starts to eat away at your capacity for this season, right? It diminishes your emotional reserves because you're grieving, right? Or if you're grieving the loss of your father who recently passed from an illness, that's going to diminish your capacity to be fully engaged in this time. And so I'm a big proponent of... One, checking in with your capacity. Two, preemptively deciding what is enough or too much. Like there are some people who say, I can only spend two hours with my family before I realize I've hit capacity, right? Or I cannot stay in the same home with in-laws or family because that is too much. Mm. And when you realize those boundaries and limits, that now gives you clarity as to how you could structure the holiday time so that it has some self-preserving quality to it. So I like to say that understanding your capacity and protecting your boundaries is actually how I love others and also love myself. Mm. Because it allows me to show up in the ways that I want to and also not engage with others in a way that might harm them simply because I've reached my capacity limit. And for those who are really truly alone um, and going through, Mm -hmm. you know, a a depression, and and again, the holidays seem to exacerbate that for so many. Um, Yeah. You know, what what can they do? Mm -hmm. I think something that I think about is, you know, do you have chosen family, right? Mm -hmm. Not birth family, but do you have those people who are often inviting you out to things and for one reason or another, you don't take them up on that? Or maybe you have a friend who's always invited you to their, you know, Christmas Eve dinner, but you've never gone. Are there open door opportunities? Because when we're feeling depressed, isolation often is one of the biggest kind of symptoms as we start to close off. We start to say, oh, nobody cares about me. I'm better off alone, right? Nobody's going to reach out. When in fact, there might actually be people who are trying their best to reach you, but they're not getting the feedback that they need that you're actually interested. And so one is, can you try as best as you can to look for the chosen people in your life, chosen family, who might be there to be with you during this difficult season? But I also think that, you know, if you are really struggling, then this might be the time, right, to pick up the phone and see if there's somebody, a provider in your area, right, who is able to take you on, you know, and work with you. Because sometimes, and I'll I'll be honest, there are times where I've had clients say to me, it feels like you're the only person that cares about me right now, which is heartbreaking. Right. But it also speaks to how now in our current day and age with technology, it is so rare to be in the presence of someone's full attention. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is all somebody needs is I'm here. Yeah. I'm with you and you can be whatever you need to be right now. I, uh, aim into that. So powerful. I, 
I have some girl, uh, some some friends in Hawaii. Whenever we would get together, we would do what we would call phone stacking. So everybody would take out their phone and pile it up, uh, one phone on top of the other, and whoever had to pick up their phone first, you know, for some reason, had to pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> That's actually how I use it. That, because yeah, it's all about phone stacking. Yes. I think it's important because there's present. so many times when you might be in the room, even with, especially with parents, not paying yeah. attention to children, right? Yeah. They might be in the room, but they're not there. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. do that to our friends. We do that to our parents. Yeah. You know, I mean, I feel like the thing that, 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 that gives us the most life is communication, right? Mm-hmm. Is connection with with each other. And we're losing so much connection yeah. with one another, like real, real conversation. Connection. Yeah. We may be connected because of social media and technology, but that's not true connection. So what Dr. Wang is saying, it's, it's that being fully present and mm. it, easier said than done in this day and age. But thank you so much for the reminder. Um, Dr. Wang, obviously we can continue talking about yes, so many yes, different could. topics. Yes, it's, so, it's so huge. And so I would invite you back again uh, to talk about this because this is an ongoing issue, clearly, um, that needs to be talked about openly as we have today. But uh, let's let's certainly continue the conversation. And thank you so much for coming on the yes. show. Yes, thank oh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and for using your platforms to amplify an issue that in our community is often so stigmatized. So thank you for offering up space and creating space for this conversation. You're so welcome. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank Happy you so holidays. very much. Oh my gosh. Wow. Thank you so very much, May, for bringing on Dr. Jenny Wong. Um, it, the, 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 the thoughts and the, how she conveyed those thoughts were so impressed upon me because I'm very new to the idea of mental health and speci- uh, specifically Asian mental health. Mm. And to hear, you know, the thoughts that she had and knowing that she has a book out, Permission to Come Home. Um, I looked it up really quickly during our interview that, oh, my God, it's on sale at Amazon for 17 and <laughs> change. But it's also at Target. So if you have a Target nearby, you can pick it up immediately for and 17 and yet- change. And better, better yet, yet, audio version, which, yes. you know, I love, right? That, that she's she reading. Narrates. That's what I want to listen to. So it's on Audible for $20 and, and and change. So And it's on Kindle for 14 and change. I already looked at all the possibilities. <laughs> oh God, but you did your research. I just, I just wanted to, you know, again, because we are in this, you know, uh, joy, you know joyful season of, of all the holidays, but to be mindful of our own mental health as well as our loved one's mental health and to, to check in and to know that we're just trying to connect, you know, and we're trying to build upon, you know, better forms of communication. And it really means about, you know, just, just checking in and reaching out. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Wang for, for joining she us was today. Terrific. And, yeah. Yeah. And helping. Yeah. And I look forward to further conversations with her. So, I think so we great. need to bring thank her back you. on for sure. So what a, what yeah. a great gift, right? Right. That, key, that book. Oh that, yeah. That's a great that's idea. A, that's a, that's a favorite thing. Well, that's a, yeah. that's a permission to come home. That's a brilliant segue, Kelly, who, right? Because what are we going right? to talk about now? It is the holidays. <laughs> Right. I'm not into like gift giving for like just gift giving sake. It should like be meaningful. Oh, there you go. That's, Permission to come home. Yep, that's Permission the book. to come home. There Dr. you go. Jenny okay. Um, yep. So we decided that we were going to feature our favorite things, kind of like Oprah's favorite things, uh, but API favorite things. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to start with my favorite things. Okay. So this is black sesame spread. Okay. Oh. And it is called Rooted Fair. Rooted Fair was started by two friends, um, Ashley Shea and Hetty Yu. All right, I got introduced to this stuff at an event, and Hetty brought a jar with her, <laughs> and she gave it to me. And I started eating, and I'm like, oh my God, this is like <laughs> seriously addiction. Like, oh stuff. my God. Closer so we can see it. This yeah. is so it's black sesame, sp- crunchy butter. So it's like peanut okay. butter, but it's black sesame, right? Oh, and so wow. they started this company, the, just the so two of them. Yep. 
And super healthy, right? Black sesame. Oh my God. I love it is very healthy, but I love anything yeah. sesame. Like give me anything sesame seed flavored oh. and I'll just gobble it up. So this stuff is incredible. Um, the, the name rooted fair, that's the name of the company. They say rooted speaks to our roots of heritage and to one another while fair means food that sustains. So that's mm -hmm, cute, right? Mm -hmm, so you can mm -hmm. get this online at rootedfair.com rootedfair.com. It's delicious. You guys, I'm telling you, they sent me this little like gift pack trio gift pack. Are I'm they not... all the same flavor or are there more than one flavor? Well, for now it's just the black sesame spread, okay. but that's all you're going to want, honey. I'm telling you, um, and I'm not, <laughs> and there's three of them. I'm not sharing. No, I'm just kidding. I might. I'm not sure <laughs> okay. So my next favorite thing is a place called butter lab. Do you see this? Oh, 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 my yeah. God. I'm so jealous right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So I just got this hand delivered from the woman oh. who started this bakery. Um, her name is Annie. Um, Annie, okay, I, I have to say her name properly. Annie Tiadi. Tiadi. And uh, she is a baker that's trained at different restaurants. And, you know, she was at Wolfgang Puck for a little while. And uh, wow. uh, yeah, it's Bago. And so she decided to branch off on her own. And, the, and she has these flavors like ube flavored crinkle cookies, matcha, um, pandan, coconut. Oh, my God. So oh, totally Asian flavors. It's, it's a lot of Asian flavors. These wow. big brownies, this is ube brownie, ube flavored brownie. Oh. Now, what's interesting about Annie is that she's not Asian. She oh. is white. Her uh -huh. husband is an Indonesian chef, Indonesian American chef. But she told me the reason why she loves using Asian flavors is that she grew up in San Jose. Um, and she said all her <laughs> friends were Asian. She said she was just surrounded yeah. by Asian culture, Asian food, Asian friends. So she, she, had, she became fascinated with Asian flavors. So now a lot of her big goods are Asian flavors. And I had her crinkle cookies at a rally that I spoke at in San Gabriel Valley um, earlier this year. And I thought I was going to faint when I ate the cookie. <laughs> So oh I had to God. feature this too. So this is called okay. Butter Lab. So B-U-T-T-E-R uh, hyphen lab dot com. So butter okay. hyphen lab dot com. You must, try, she has cakes, she has tarts, she has uh, pies as well. Okay. All right. You had butter, butter, butter lab, butter, butter lab. lab. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Next okay. is Honey Bell. Now this is an all natural, like cruelty free, you know, non-toxic company that makes soaps and different lotions and things like that. This is a soap. It's a loofah soap. Oh. It has oh, yeah. a loofah in the soap. It's embedded in the soap. So when you use it in the shower, you're like loofahing and soaping at the same time. It's amazing. I love this. And they have all different scents available. So this Wait, is- Wait, do you guys not use scrub cloths? I do, but I when I no, okay. but when I discovered this stuff again at, at the it's two and one, it was two and one. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. Honey Bell and all natural, right? All natural, yeah, uh, eco conscious, right. Um, right. cruelty free, all of that. So this is Honey Bell. Okay, all right. Nice. Moving right along. Now this is sort of higher end. This is Lemieux. So oh. Lemieux oh. skincare. Lemieux was started by Janelle Liu. And, oh, I should say uh, Honey Bell was started by Iris Churn and uh, with her husband, Calvin. Okay. All right. So Lemieux was started by Janelle Liu, Korean-American woman, uh, back in 2004. And so she develops with a whole team of researchers and scientists really interesting serums and lotions that, you know, for skincare, anti-aging, you know, so that, you know, you don't have to go under the knife, I, I guess. But anyway... <laughs> But this product that I use all the time, it's called the IOI, Ionized Oxygen Infuser. So basically- IOI. Okay. IOI. So this is like the activator you pour into this little container. Then you put a little bit of their serums. They have various serums, if you want, depending on what you want. And then you mix it all up and then you turn it on and it's like a sprayer. You Ooh, spray, it on, spray it on, right? And Wait, do you do this every day or is this like a treatment? No, I try to do it like every other day, but you could uh -huh. definitely do it every day. Okay. Can't you yeah. tell? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it's really great because it's very hydrating. And because of the ionizer, it makes everything s- into smaller particles so that it gets absorbed into your skin more easily. Ah, okay. So okay. Janelle is all about trying to use research and science to help, you know, skincare. But Lemieux is a great product. I love her stuff. Um, so definitely that's on my favorite uh, thing. And then finally, um, I wanted to give a shout out to Michelle Lee and the Yay! Very Asian Very Asian Foundation. Michelle that's came right. out with this book, A Very Asian Guide to Korean Food, right? And it's such a cute, illust- it's such cute little illustrations of different Korean foods for kids mm. to learn mm. about. Mm-hmm. I think she wants to do a whole series. But the Very Asian Foundation does great work. Michelle started it just, you know, earlier this year after she got kind of a racist call about eating dumplings on New Year's. And she oh. has just, yeah, that's Michelle. So she Michelle. then decided to take something really negative and spin it around, you know, flip it. Right. Flip yeah. the story and call, you know, saying very Asian is actually a very positive thing rather than a right. negative thing. So, right. so I love you, Michelle. And I love Yay, the work Michelle that you're doing. Lee. So this is a great little gift for your kids. So I love that she did that. I know. Yeah, for her. Right. Yeah, We're yeah, going to have her yeah, on the yeah. show too, for sure. But um, okay, those are my favorite things. Who's next? Okay. Uh, I'll go next. Um, I have two treats, but I only have one package because so, so this package and Kelly, you'll probably know it, is the Maui Cookie Cool Quiz. Yeah, and these are the original, and this is uh, a company that was founded by Mrs. Kui. So I'm assuming that uh, she is uh, Chinese American descent, but she's from the islands. But there's another cookie company that I want to give a shout out. Um, they're called Aloha Cookie, K U K I. Aloha. Oh, and okay. ha is in parentheses. Alo, because the founder's name is Micah Alo. And they're out of Wailuku, Maui. They make the best chocolate chip cookies I've ever tasted in a packet. Um, also from Maui. Excuse me. Kelly Hu, do you know these Maui crisps? I do not. What, what are, are those? Shiza. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to open this package. They're artisanal beef chips. They're made in Maui. Uh, uh, they have a variety of, uh, uh, of flavors, but it's www.maui, M-A-U-I, crisps, C-R-I-S-P-S dot com. Crisp. They are the most bomb ass <laughs> beef jerky because look at how thin they are. Oh, oh, so they're like, they're like chips. Yeah. Oh, so they're, they're almost they're, like they're, seaweed, right? Like nori. Not, not that thin. Not that thin. Okay. But, but. Thinner than be re- and the flavor. Oh my God, <laughs> Maui crisps. Oh my God, online. I think they're mostly sold out, but they have to restock or re- they have to make them themselves. Up. Maui crisps. Okay. And I forgot what the owners' names are, but um, oh, she just um, texted me because I I call, tried calling them online and they were all sold out. And I go blah 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 blah. Oh, they were all sold out. Something. Wow. Okay. So oh, yeah. Maui crisps. But they're okay. yeah, totally uh, totally mm. uh, Maui yeah. Maui born as well. Another local person is the Tanaka Farms in Irvine, California. I know Tanaka Farms. They sell this blackberry jam, which is one of my favorite jams. Tanaka Farms, Irvine. Mm. Um, Got to give it a shout out. Wonderful gifts. They have fruits. They have vegetables. It's a it's an old fashioned vegetable fruit stand with other prepared foods like like nuts and yeah. and all kinds of they doodads. Have great stuff there. Awesome stuff. Um, for beauty. I really love uh, false eyelashes when I have to do go out. Doe eyelashes out of Orange County, California. Oh. Founded by a 20, he's a 20 something. He, he? Jason what? Fong. I think it's Jason, Jason Fong. I, I, yeah. And he's he's this young. Wait, tell um, me why you like those because there's so many they're, false eyelashes out there. Because they're lightweight. Okay. They're lightweight. They're reusable, so you just have to clean them off gently because mm-hmm. I've worn these 15, 20 times because usually the eyelashes start to disintegrate, but they have such a variety. Mm-hmm. And they, they feature um, how to apply uh, eyelashes for Asian um, lids because it can be difficult. Oh, you know, interesting. It, the, the spacing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
No, so, I'm so, so glad. I'm so glad you brought that because I always have a hard time finding eyelash, fake eyelashes that look good because sometimes they're just, they look so unnatural and weird. Right. Right. So, right. There's yeah. a Japanese trend right now, right? These girls with these. No, I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't do that. I mean, good for them, but no, I just think it looks weird. Also, so there. three other things. This is a really cute um, Filipino jewelry maker out of Toronto, Toronto, Canada. And they're called Cambio, C A M B I O, and Company. And their jewelry is specific to the heritage of Filipinas. And so they're kind of, you know, they're very uh, oh, ornate. Cool. Ooh, beautiful. But they're not gold, but they're, you know, sustainably made. They're in Toronto and Manila. And they're really lovely in the terms of uh, the Spanish heritage as well as the indigenous Filipino populations oh, nice. celebrating the beauty. So I just wanted to give out to shout out to Cambio and Company. And I think their founder's name is Jelaine Santiago, and they're out of Toronto and Manila. And also, I think we're all familiar with, but I just wanted to give out a, another shout out to, because it's the end of the year and we're always looking for gifts to our mutual friends. Ah, uh, Jeff oh, Yang. Oh, yeah. Bill, you, and Philip Wong, yep. and Jeff Yang for their rise, um, pop culture, Asian America since the 90s. And I just wanted to give a shout out because it's a really great book for, you know, youngsters, for oldsters to know what, you know, you, uh, us, us three, really are tuned into or plugged into and connected with and it's just a it's a real uh wonderful kind of wide swath and interpretation of what it means to be asian and american nowadays and it's a it's a really great gift it's really you know it doesn't they, admittedly they don't cover everything but they try to cover as they much try. as they could over yeah. the last two years that they've you know uh, uh considered writing this book so i just wanted to give them a shout out. So yeah. So those are my nice know, favorite things. Good those are list. so good. good oh, thank you. Now, I, I have to say I, I had to travel with my gifts. So, you know, yes. I didn't have a lot of time to, to prepare because, uh, I had to bring them with me. And then I was like, even just before, uh, we started recording, I actually had to go get my last gift oh, wow. here in New oh, York. Oh my God. A for yeah. effort. A for effort. <laughs> Yay. So, but you know me, I love coffee. Like that's my thing. I cannot wake up in the morning without my coffee. I don't feel like I'm alive without my coffee. <laughs> like I might as well be dead if I don't get a cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah, and like this me. coffee is amazing. Oh, yes. 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 Well, you guys know Sarah. about this, right? And yes. they also have like, it's Vietnamese, obviously. And um, it's uh, their mission is to increase the visibility of Vietnamese coffee because uh, Vietnamese coffee, people tend to think that it is not a good quality, but it is yeah. so good. If you actually go to Vietnam and you have Vietnamese coffee, oh, it's it amazing. is unbelievable. They're one of the biggest yeah. exporters of coffee, and, and people right. don't know that. Yeah, right, yes. right. And 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 they promote social, cultural, and economic sustainability. Yeah. So yeah, and they have these. Um, they also sell these great little like Vietnamese, you know, like little the, the, coffee making. Yeah, I still haven't yeah. figured out how to use one. Yeah, but. They sell them. <laughs> you have to be patient with the Vietnamese coffee dripping because it takes a little while, but it is so delicious because it's so rich. I, yeah, mm. I think I think Dustin Wynn told me that you know when you uh, have when you share coffee with another person with Vietnamese style, it's the intention to spend time with that other person. It makes sense. So you are with, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's a nice little ritual you know yeah. to share with your other partner. So yeah. yeah. Now Sarah, I had on my show before the May Lee show before uh, when oh yeah I've had her on and we talked about her whole story and how she really wanted to push Vietnamese coffee and help local growers in Vietnam. Oh, so she sources Vietnam? them from Vietnam. She knows all the farmers. Yeah, it's all fair trade. It's all fair yeah, trade. She's great. She, it's all about the Robusta bean, which is something that's uncommon because most beans come from like Colombia, you know, all these other places. Okay. And so there was a real resistance, of course, in the Western world uh, to this Robusta bean, but now it's really caught on and she's it's doing phenomenally well. She's yeah. really, it's incredible. She had to learn coffee making and everything from scratch. She had no wow. background in this. So wow. for her to build a business wow. on coffee and on like sourcing coffee to roasting coffee to like then deliver, you know, marketing it, it was all, she all learned it from scratch. So, uh, well, wow. great. Good Kudos for her. For her. Yeah. So what, what, what made her go into coffee? Theme. 
Oh, you guys know yeah. this one, right? Oh, Jing. Fly by. Yes. Fly by Jing. Yes. So, so awesome. good. <laughs> oh my God. Like this is a stocking stuffer for sure. Yes. Yeah, I put sure. it on everything, and I don't even like spicy food. Oh, like, <laughs> it's so it's good not, though. Like it's not like you know, like burning a hole in your stomach, kind of spicy. <laughs> like you're not gonna remember that you had this the next day. <laughs> but it is, it's so good, and it's like just enough kick that it's like it makes your food really, you know, yeah. different. And it's got like a little bit of a like a crunch to it because it's like crisp, right? She's got, uh, they've got three different flavors, right? Uh, yeah. And they sell them, I think, at Target in a trio for like twenty dollars or something. Oh, nice! Something like that. I know they were selling these, um, you know, in a two pack at um, Costco. But you know how Costco always does this: you buy something, you know, you discover something there, you buy it, you fall in love with it, and then it's gone. And then it's gone. gone <laughs> yeah. So right. I don't know if they're going to bring it back, yeah. or maybe only certain Costcos had it, or whatever. But anyway, that's, that's one. Uh, one that's of my favorite one. food stuffs at the moment. Um, Another uh, company that I really like with skincare. So this is called Care. You see, oh, these are two okay. ladies out of New York, and um, they uh, are both in. They've both been in like the skincare industry for you know combined forty years, um, and they specifically make this for older women who have gone through menopause because Ooh. you know when you go through menopause your skin gets much drier and it's hard to retain the moisture and so these two products are amazing mm. to help keep your skin moist i mean you don't have to have gone through menopause in order to use this <laughs> <laughs> but but i love the fact that they really marketed towards older women who, Ooh. because we have different issues, right? With our skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's great. I, oh, nice. I loved it. They sent me some, some free ones and then I went and picked up some oh, um, myself. It was, it was awesome. I have to say. So the last thing um, that I went to go and pick up just before coming here. So I have been a fan of this uh, woman's line and she started off with these body chains. She had these like body jewelry that you would wear. And she said she actually made it to wear under women's clothing because it wasn't for other people. It was for women themselves. So I Ooh, kind of fell in love with this whole concept, right, of, of wearing all these undergarments. And I didn't even realize that she was from Hawaii. So her oh. name is Bliss Lau. And um, and she has her, her little office, you know, right uh, in, um, in Nolita. And so this Ooh. is one of the pieces. Oh, wow. Oh, that's beautiful. I, it's She calls this the chevron. So her whole idea was she started with making, um, she's from Hawaii. She, she went to Parsons, okay. you know, here in New York and never yeah. left. Okay. She, um, she actually started off making handbags and then the body jewelry. Now she does all of this high end jewelry, but this is, um, you know, not like real gold or anything. So this, this piece is, um, you know, if you want to give a nice generous piece, this mm -hmm. is like about $300. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Um, and, uh, and it's called the Chevron. Um, That's and, gorgeous. uh, was it Chrysler? Sorry. It's called the Chrysler. Oh, Chrysler. I'm getting my oh, like the building, oh, like, like, the, the, yeah, building. like the building. Yes, like the building. yes, yes. Right. And, um, and so she actually, you know, she's had her company uh, for 21 years. Um, she started when she was so young. She was already selling to like big department stores and everything when she was only 25 years old. She said she would go to the bank to um, like make the deposits, and the teller would white out the 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 balance because they thought that she was the intern and that she shouldn't see how much <laughs> was in the actual account. Oh no. <laughs> But, oh, um, but yeah, so she makes, you know, really beautiful high end pieces and she got really well known all of a sudden when Beyonce wore her pieces in one of her videos. Oh, hello. So, yeah. Hello. All she was wearing yeah. was this and a body chain. Oh my God. Nothing else. <laughs> wow. Oh, well that's, yeah. that's going to probably give you some exposure. Yeah. Oh, right. good yeah. for her. I'm literally and figuratively. Yeah, yeah, he literally. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's funny. Wow, that's beautiful. Wow, that's oh my gorgeous. gosh, so is that all of our, that's everyone's list? That's it. I what? only have, oh, and she, she also gave me this to wear as well. Oh, nice. Isn't that a beautiful piece of jade? Wait, so sorry, what's the name of that company? Bliss Lau. Bliss Lau, Lau. okay. Bliss, Bliss Lau. Lau. Okay, we're going to put all of this information in the show notes so that people know where to go and, you know, all the websites and everything like that. But I love our list of favorite things. Yeah, we've got quite yeah. a, a, a wide okay, spectrum collection. of stuff. Yeah. I know, and now Although that, we do have a lot of food. We do have a lot of food. <laughs> I, honestly, we're, we're, we're I, I so wish I could yeah. share this entire platter. Oh I'm so jealous. Ah, I know. I can't wait to t- uh, taste some of this stuff. But um, but yeah, no, that was great. So there were just some ideas for everyone. You know, we just wanted yes. to give you some ideas, especially because they're API connection related. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We want to support, mm-hmm. especially the small API business owners um, who a lot of them started during COVID. You know, I mean, a lot of people right. had to kind of get creative. And uh, so it's kind of interesting to see them do really well, having started from mm-hmm. very little and now, you know, you know, growing their businesses. So we want to support that. Um, but that brings us, I think, to the end of the show. So one last announcement. Um, as we've been saying, these have been beta episodes that we have been dropping. And this is our final beta episode of this series. So we started in October, had it one in November, and now one in December. In January, we are planning on doing our official launch of Shoes Off Inside. And we're going to be doing two episodes a month. That's how we're going to start see how that goes um but yeah so we're we want to bring y'all on board um and please spread the word about the show uh because as you can see we have a lot of fun um but we also want to <laughs> dig we also want to dig deeper into issues that we care about um and so also we would love to hear from you if you have ideas or comments or anything please let us know right bring it on bring, bring it, on. it on exactly yep. okay all right ladies that brings us to the end of this episode. So thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. So much fun. I yeah. miss you guys already. I know. Oh my gosh. Have fun in the greatest city in the world. I know, and, the and big kick ass over there. Yeah. yeah exactly. And thank you, May, for bringing us all together again. And thank you again, Dr. Jenny Wong, for for your for your notes and thoughts and feelings about you know mental health and yeah. how we should take care of one of one another as well as ourselves. So thank oh. you. And thank you to our producer, Michelle Miao. Yes. All right. Until next time, everyone, you take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.